Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Grandstream Tech Talk. This is Abdel Jabar. I am a support engineer with Grandstream Networks. Uh, as you might already know, Grandstream Tech Talk is a webinar series in which we we'll provide tutorials on the most popular subjects chosen by our customers. So every quarter, Grandstream sends a survey to our customers to choose a topic or subject that you would like us to include. So in today's episode, we will be covering the following topics, UCM upgrade and backup, securing outbound routes, endpoint security best practices, and remote workers best practices. So on a regular basis, all Grandstream product software are updated and the latest firmware versions are available in the Grandstream website by going to support firmware. So new firmware versions are published to include new enhancements and fixes for reported issues. And all changes are added to the release notes. So before you start doing a UCM upgrade, we always recommend to read the release notes, which may include special firmware upgrade notes. And usually if there is a security or major bug that you need to pay attention to, we're going to include that one here. So for example, in this note, it talks about security vulnerability that was found in firmware version 1.0.20.22 and earlier. So you need to make sure that your UCM is on a firmware version that is above this version right here. Then if you go to the release note, which is somewhere here, uh, it also provides you with some notes and they are usually highlighted in red. And the importance of reading this, these notes, sometimes there are some important notes that you need to read before you start doing the upgrade of your UCM. For example, if your UCM is running an old firmware version, let's say uh, 1.0, 1.15, when you read the release note, it's going to mention that you, you need to upgrade the UCM to version 16, then 17, 18, 19, then you can upgrade it all the way to the latest version, which is 1.0.20.38. And it also provides you with the firmware file. You can just simply download those previous firmware files by clicking on these icons, including the release notes as well. So let me go back here again. So when you download the firmware file and you click on the uh, firmware that you would like to upload to the UCM, it provides you again with the release note and the firmware file. So once you click on it, it's going to ask you to save the firmware file. I believe I have that firmware file here already. Yeah. So when you download the firmware file, it's in zip format. So you have to extract the folder that includes the firmware file. And the Grandstream firmware file has usually the name UCM6200FW.bin, depending, of course, on the UCM model. And that's the firmware file that you need to upload to the UCM. This might sound basic, but we still see a lot of people who try to upgrade the UCM using the zipped format. So to extract the firmware file is very simple. You just right click on it and then extract it to a specified folder where you can have access to it when doing the UCM upgrade. All right, so let's log into the web interface of the UCM so I can show you how to do the upgrade. So the upgrade option is available under maintenance. So the UCM supports both uh, firmware provisioning and manual upload of the firmware file. So if you want to do the provision of the firmware file, we support three methods, TFTP, HTTP, and HTTPS. So for example, if you want to use TFTP, you just need to include the domain name or the IP address of your TFTP server. So as I mentioned earlier, when using the firmware provisioning, the UCM is going to request the binary file, which is UCM6200FW.bin. You can change the name that the UCM requests using the file prefix. And this is useful when you have the same path used for multiple firmware versions. Let me show you an example here. So I have my TFTP server here. So if I log in and then I go to the folder, the UCM. So in case I want to point the UCM to grab the firmware from that folder, I simply need to add the folder where the firmware files are included, which is the UCM. By default, 
the UCM is going to request the firmware file with the name UCM6200FW.bin. So in case you have the same folder hosting multiple firmware versions, you can actually assign them different names. For example, this firmware file here for firmware version 1.0.19 is prefixed with 19. This is something that you can change it manually. You can go to rename and then you can make it 19 or you can make it, for example, 1.0.19. It's up to you how you want to assign it a name. So I'm just going to make going to make it simple and give it 19. So when you want the UCM to request that specific file, you just add the 19 here as the prefix so that the UCM will prefix the default one, which is this one with 19, and it's going to request that file here. The same thing applies to the suffix. And this is something that is very common on all grand stream devices. We use the prefix and the suffix. Next, we have the HTTP and HTTPS uh, username and password. This is in case your server is protected with the password. You can include the uh, credentials in these two boxes. So these are the options available for firmware provisioning. In case you want to do manual upload of the firmware file, it's very simple. You just go to firmware file path, click on this, and then you go to the folder that includes the firmware file. The firmware should be in a bin format. Once you click on open, the UCM is going to start uploading the firmware. If there is an active call during that process, the call will not be interrupted. So the UCM is going to keep uploading the firmware. When, once the firmware upload is complete, then it's going to ask you to reboot the UCM. Once you click on yes, reboot the UCM, of course, if there are any active calls, they will be disconnected. So the updates, the actual update of the firmware happens after you reboot the UCM. This option here is for GS Wave, and that's uh, a special firmware that you need to upload using the web interface of the UCM. So usually when you're dealing with upgrading the UCM, you're gonna use the firmware file path. So always before you start upgrading your UCM, it is strongly recommended to back up your system. So in case something goes wrong or uh, you uploaded the wrong firmware file to the UCM, like the wrong firmware version, because sometimes if you don't follow the instructions in the release note, let's say you have a very old version and you upgrade it to the latest firmware version, that might cause some data corruption. So you might notice that your system will start behaving uh, uh, abnormally. So to avoid such issues, always take a backup of your system. So in case you make a mistake, you can always go back and then upload the backup to your UCM. To take a backup of the UCM, the process is very simple. You just go to backup, then you click on backup in case you want to do manual backup. And then you have the files that you would like to backup. There's the config file, CDR, recording. In case you want to use the config file, you can use the local storage if you want to. Even if we always recommend to use an external drive window in a backup. However, when you try to backup the whole system and you try to use the local storage, the UCM is going to generate an error for you. You can use the local storage of the UCM to backup only the config file. So in case you want to backup all the files, then you need to have an external drive connected to the UCM, either a USB drive or an SD card. So once you do that and you backup the system, the backup will be uploaded to the USB disk. This is this might take a few minutes depending on the size of your uh, configuration. So once you have the configuration backed up on your USB or SD card, you will see that backup right here. In case you would like to restore a backup, it's, the process is very simple. You just click on restore icon. In case you want to download this backup file to your local directory on your computer, you can click on the download as well. In case you have a backup stored on your computer and you would like to upload it to the UCM, you can use the upload option here. So we talked about the manual backup of the UCM. There is also the option to backup your system to an SFTP server. So I have my SFTP server configured here. So you need to have an SFTP server that has been tested uh, and make sure that it is working. So you just enable this option and then you include the account 
on your SFTP server and the password associated with that. The IP address, by default, if you don't include the port number, the UCM is going to use port 22. So in case your SFTP server is using a different port, just make sure you include that one with the IP address the same way I'm doing it on my SFTP server. And then here it's going to ask you for the directory. The directory that I have on my SFTP server is called SFTP. And then here it asks you about the sync time, where basically you specify the hour of the day where you want the uh, UCM to store the backup on your SFTP uh, server. So once you have that configuration, every day at 1 p.m., the UCM is going to back up the system to your SFTP server. And then here you have two options in case you want to test the connection to your SFTP. So mine here shows successful. In case you want to do uh, immediate backup to your SFTP server, you can also use this option, synchronize all data. And then if you go to the, your SFTP server, let me go back here. So this is my SFTP server. So this is the directory that I have configured here. So if the, this one had a different name, then I had to uh, include that name right here as well. So this is the backup that I just did with the test connection and it gives you the date. And if you look right here, it gives you it's a test. That's a simply a test uh, backup, All right? Then save and apply the changes. The other option that you can configure uh, in case you want to do a backup on your USB drive or an SFTP server, you can also use the schedule option uh, and you specify the files that you would like to backup. And then if you select this option here, you have two options. There's the USB. In case you have an SD card, it's going to show it an SD card as well. Uh, so in case you don't have an SFTP server and you just want to back up your system on a USB drive on a regular basis, you can also specify that using the scheduled backup. You just include the time and the day. So for example, here one, it means the first day of the month, the UCM will back up the system at midnight. Then save and apply those changes to take effect. So next we move to the second topic of today's webinar, which is securing outbound calls. So the UCM includes multiple ways to secure making outbound calls through the UCM. The first option is permission level, where you can set up an outbound route with specific privilege or permission level. So if a user has a privilege level that is not equal or less than the permission level configured at the outbound route, that specific extension or user will not be able to make a call through the outbound route. The second option is dial pattern. This option is very important because you specify which numbers can be dialed from specific outbound routes. The third option is the password where you can configure an outbound route with password. So only users who know the password or who are able to enter the password, which is a pin number, will be able to make calls through that specific outbound route. And the password is a common pin number that is used by multiple users. So when you compare it to the pin group, pin group is a unique password. We assign each user a unique password that they can use to make outbound calls through a specific route. And fifthly, there's the option to filter on source caller ID where you can specify which extensions will be allowed to make calls through a specific outbound route. And number six, we have the outbound blacklist where you can include specific numbers that won't be allowed. You can also use the pattern. For example, if you want to block 900 numbers, you can just use 900 and you can use the characters supported for the dial plan. You can also blacklist certain countries, something that I'm going to show you during the uh, live demo. So let's go back to the web interface of the UCM so we can see how we can configure all of these options. All right, so for the outbound routes, we go under extension, trunks, and then we can select outbound routes. As you can see, I have two outbound routes here. Uh, let's go ahead and add another one. We can just call this one test outbound routes. So we talked about the dial pattern. The dial pattern defines the number that can be dialed through that specific outbound route. For example, in case you want to restrict outbound calls to 10 digit numbers, 
you can use this pattern. So the users, they can only use 10 digits or they can only call 10 digit numbers through this outbound route. This is useful, especially when you have one SIP trunk that allows you to make international calls and you don't want specific users to make international calls through a system. So you can define that one so that they can only use the 10 digits. Then you can create another outbound route for international calls. You can also use the three digits pattern like, like X, X, or you can be more explicit and include the number that they can dial, for example, 911. So each outbound route that you create will be assigned a privilege level. By default, the privilege level is disabled. Okay, so you have four options, internal, local, national, international. Those levels, they don't have a literal meaning. In other words, if you set the outbound route to international, it doesn't mean you will be able to call international. These privilege levels are useful when you compare them to the privilege levels under the extension. So every time you create an extension on the UCM, you will need to assign it permission level or privilege level. So for an extension to be able to make a call through this outbound route, that extension needs to have a privilege level that is equal to or higher than the one set at the outbound route. For example, this outbound route is configured with local. So for an extension to make a call through this outbound route, it needs to have a privilege level of local, national, or international. If the internal extension has a privilege level of internal, it will not be able to make a call through this outbound route. Next, we have the option of a password. And the password, as I mentioned, is a common password that you define for the outbound route. So for any user to make an outbound call through this route, they need to use that password. And the difference between password and the pin groups is that pin groups are more granular. In other words, you can assign a pin number to each user and you can put these users in groups. For example, if we look at sales, something that I'm going to show you later where you configure the pin groups, you will see that each user will have his or her uh, own pin number. You can use the pin number in combination with the privilege level just by checking this box right here. So I'm going to leave that one unchecked. So once you select one of these options, you will notice that the other options will become grayed out. For example, the privilege level, the password, as well as the enable on source caller ID. So for example, if I disable that one, then I will have the option to use this feature. And the purpose of using this feature is you specify which extensions will be able to make outbound calls through this route. So if we go here, and then it's going to show you all the extensions. So for example, if I only select these two extensions here, only these two will be able to make outbound calls through that specific route. So we can use this example, and then we can select an outbound route, then save and apply the changes. So we talked about the pin group. So this is where you create the pin groups. So let's go ahead and create one. As you can see, I already have two groups created. So let's edit one of these. If you want to add one, you just click on add, by the way. So let's go ahead and look at one of these. So this is the sales pin group. And then you have this option record in CDR. So when you enable this option, if someone like, let's say Mike made an outbound call and then he used his pin number, which is 2020, it's going to show up under CDR. And I'm going to show you later how, how you're going to see it. It doesn't show the pin number, but it shows the name of the user and the pin group to which that user belongs to. And you can add multiple users. I can call this one, for example, this is for Sarah, save. And then you can give those pin numbers to users. So in case they want to make an outbound call through a specific route, they need to use their pin number. And when you go to the outbound route, as I showed you, you need to select the pin group. For example, if this one is assigned to sales, you need to select sales. Then save and apply. So if we go to CDR, this is what it's going to show. 
So this is an example. So Mike tried to call this number. Okay. So under account code, it's going to show you Mike as the user and then the pin group to which Mike belongs to. So let me go back here to the outbound again. Uh, we talked earlier about outbound blacklists where you can blacklist the numbers that users can dial from the uh, UCM. So the outbound route blacklist is global. In other words, it applies to uh, all the outbound routes created on the UCM. So as I mentioned, you can block my country. Uh, so if you have like uh, users who make phone calls to a specific country in Europe, let's say France, for example, you can choose France. So if someone tries to call the country code uh, of France, which is 33, the UCM is going to block that call. You can also uh, define an explicit dial pattern that users cannot call out. So let's say you don't want the users to make outbound calls to 800 numbers. So you can specify a pattern like this. So every time anyone tries to call a number that starts with 1800 or 1900, uh, any other number that matches whatever we have configured here, the UCM is going to block them. There is also the option to import a CSV file. So for example, if you have a list of numbers that you don't want the users to call from the uh, UCM, you can actually import that list. In case you're looking for the template, you can just export the uh, whatever you have here, then you can use that template to fit it up with that information so you can import it. All right, so let me go back here one more again. And again, you can create as many outbound routes as you want on the UCM. And I believe you can create up to 500 outbound routes on the UCM 6200. Uh, most of the time you're going to be dealing with easy to configure outbound routes. But when you have um, a complex deployment, the outbound routes might get more complex. So let's look at this example here. So if you have two UCMs, like uh, the case we have here, one UCM in France and the other one in the United States, and you would like to allow users in France to make calls through the UCM in the US through the SIP trunk so that the UCM in France won't be charged for international calls. So let's go back to the UCM and see how we can configure that setup. All right, so if we go to VoIP trunks, I have one peer trunk, okay, with France. So let's go ahead and create an inbound route for that one. Let's see if we have any. France, okay. So let's add the inbound route. So we're just gonna use a global pattern for now. And usually when using the peer-to-peer -peer connection between two UCMs and you would like users on each UCM to call each other, uh, the default destination, you always set it to by the ID. Most of the time you set it to by the ID because that's what you want to achieve. You want to allow users uh, from UCM A to call users on UCM B. And basically when you choose by the ID, you tell the UCM to read the destination caller ID and forward the call based on the uh, destination caller ID. So when you set this option to by the ID, few other options pop up under the inbound route. And one of them is allow the DID extensions. In other words, when users that are registered to the UCM in France would you like to allow them to call only extensions or would you like them to have access to other features like uh, calling into the call queue, IVR, voice map group, and etc. So for this example, I'm just going to leave it as extensions. Then you have the other option here, which is dial trunk. So for example, in our case, we would like the users in France to be able to make calls to cell phones here in the United States. So we definitely want to make sure to check that one to dial trunk because we want users in France to be able to call from the US UCM. And then you have this option here. So once you check dial trunk, you will have the option to specify the privilege level that you would like to assign to these calls coming through this outbound route. So earlier we configured the outbound route with local privilege. 
So if we set this option to internal on this inbound route, calls coming to 10 digits through the SIP trunk with the UCM in France will not be able to go through the outbound route that we just created. So we have to make sure that we set, we set the privilege level again to a privilege that is equal to or higher than the privilege level that is assigned to the outbound route. So this is how you allow users register to the UCM in France to make calls to 10 digit number here in the United States. So you just make sure you check the dial trunk and then you set the privilege level uh, based on the ones that you have configured under the outbound route. So once you save and apply these, these changes, when the call comes from that UCM in France, the UCM in US will forward it through this uh, outbound route. So just make sure we disable that option and we set that one to local and we can remove the password. You can also assign them password if you want to. So that users, if they want to call from the UCM in France, they must enter a password to be able to call from that specific uh, outbound route. So you have a lot of options that you can play with and you have a lot of features that you can enable or disable uh, depending on the business needs or the user uh, requirements. Next, we're going to talk about the last two subjects in today's uh, webinar, which is endpoint security best practices and remote workers best practices. First, let's look at this deployment scenario. So we have UCM here located at the headquarters, and then we have remote users connected and registered to the UCM in the headquarters. And then we have callers calling from outside. So for this deployment scenario to work, there are certain configuration requirements that you need to implement on the UCM, the edge router, and the remote extensions. So the first thing, the edge router, or the router behind which the UCM is sitting, needs to be configured with port forwarding to allow the remote extensions to register to the UCM. And also to avoid issues related to uh, audio, the UCM has an option that we call RTP Keep Alive. So when a caller calls into the UCM, the UCM will forward the call to a remote worker. When one of these users picks up the call and they start talking, both audio traffic will be initiated from outside the edge router. And eventually the edge router will block the RTP traffic because it's not initiated from inside the network. The purpose of using RTP Keep Alive is that it allows the UCM to read the connection information or the IP address and port number that would be used for RTP or audio. And then it's going to send some comfort noise RTP packets to, uh, to the caller and to the remote user to allow the router to establish that connection in the NAT table. Or in other words, punch holes in the router. And this allows the audio traffic from this user to reach the UCM and then the UCM will forward that traffic back to the remote user and vice versa. So without this option here, you will need to configure port forwarding for RTP port range. And by default, you, the UCM uses the port range 10,000 to 20,000. In other words, you have to go to your edge router and configure port forwarding for UDP ports 10,000 to 20,000. But using this option does not require configuring uh, port forwarding for the RTP traffic. Another option that is also important to configure on the remote IP phones is the stun configuration. And the stun configuration basically allows the IP phone to learn its public IP address so that it can use that public IP address in the SIP message that it sends to the UCM so that the UCM can use that information to forward the traffic or the RTP traffic to the remote extension. So this is just a an explanation of how STUN works. So when the IP phones are located behind a private network, they have no idea about the public IP address where they are located. So they have to use the STUN. STUN is one of the mechanisms. There are other mechanisms that can be used to learn about the public IP address. So when the IP phone is configured with a STUN server, the IP phone will send a binding request to the STUN server asking about its public IP address. And then the stun server will respond back to the phone with its private with its public IP address 
and and the IP phone would use that information to communicate with the UCM. Another option also available on the uh, Grandstream IP phones in the UCM as well is OpenVPN configuration. So when you have a router with OpenVPN server, you can configure the IP phones with OpenVPN so that they can connect securely to the router through a VPN tunnel. Both the Grandstream IP phones and the UCM can only work as OpenVPN clients. So you need to have a router or a server that supports OpenVPN. So you can use that as an OpenVPN server. All right, so now let's go back to the web interface of the UCM and the IP phone so I can show you where to enable and set up those features. So I'm gonna log into one of the phones. Uh, so I have my GRP2615. So the first thing I would recommend to change when you have remote phones is to change the local SIP port of the IP phone. By default, the first account is using 5060 and the second account is using 5062. It basically, uh, for each account, it, it increments by two. So as you can see here, I already changed that one from 5060 to 5090. The reason I recommend this because some home routers, they don't have a strong security, which allows like hackers who scan the default port for SIP 5060 to hit the phone. So that's why we want to change that port from 5060 to a different port. The other option that you can use in case you want to change them to random port numbers is you can use this option, use a random port. You can set this option to yes. So when you use this option, the IP phone is going to use random ports for both SIP and RTP. And as you can see here, the phone is using port 5004 for RTP. So when you set this option to yes, the phone is going to generate random ports for each uh, SIP registration. And the reason why we recommend making these changes is to avoid get, getting ghost calls or phantom calls. If changing these ports is not possible, you can also implement other security features that can protect against ghost and phantom calls. And these features are available under account, SIP settings, security settings. So let's look at them here. Let me reset those options so we can look at what's the default. So these are the default settings on the IP phone. All of these options are set to no. Two of the settings that we recommend to enable on the remote IP phones to protect against ghost calls and phantom calls is this option right here, which is accept incoming SIP from proxy only and check SIP user ID for incoming invite. You can also add this option here, which is authenticate incoming invite. However, some servers might reject that option. This option works fine with the UCM, but when you enable it with a third party platform, it might cause the call to be rejected. Because basically when you enable this option, the phone is going to authenticate the server and some servers don't like to be authenticated. So I'm just gonna set that one to no, then save and apply these changes. In case you wanna create a VPN tunnel, so that you can have a secure connection, you can use the OpenVPN settings. You just set that one to yes. You enter the IP address of your OpenVPN server, and it's gonna be a public IP address. Uh, you define the port that is gonna be used by the OpenVPN server. By default uh, servers, they use 1194, but in case you change that port, you also need to make sure that the phone is using the same port number. And also you specify the transport, whether it's UDP or TCP, and you can upload your CA and uh, CERT and the key certificates here. Uh, these certificates are generated by the OpenVPN server. Another thing also make sure that you are using the uh, correct cipher method. So these are the ones supported on the IP phone. And in case you are using certificates with uh, username authentication, you can add that information here. In case you are using some other options like 
and here it gives you some uh, hints about how to include multiple elements together in this box. So basically use the uh, semicolon to add more parameters to your OpenVPN configuration. So once you save and enable this configuration, OpenVPN settings require rebooting the IP phone. So after you reboot or before you reboot the IP phone, just make sure you go to uh, account, network settings, and make sure you set the NAT traversal to VPN so that the IP phone use the IP address of the VPN tunnel when communicating with the uh, SIP server. Then just save and apply the changes, then you can reboot the phone. And earlier also we talked about stun configuration. So in case you are not using OpenVPN, uh, you're just using normal connection, uh, you can enable stun on the IP phone. So there are two settings that you need to enable here. You need to make sure that NAT traversal is set to stun, save and apply the changes. And if you have multiple accounts, you need to enable the same option for each account. So now that we enabled NAT traversal for stun, we can go under settings, general settings. And this is where you can configure the stun server. There are so many stun servers out there and they are all free. You can use any one of them. For Grandstream, we use the uh, stun server built into GDMS, or you can use the one used by IP Video Talk, which is stunipvideotalk.com. Then save and apply the changes. So these are the settings required for remote extensions. Another uh, thing or some of the mistakes that you need to avoid, because I see a lot of uh, remote users uh, do that, uh, sometimes they use the same server as the outbound proxy. Outbound proxy is different. If you are using the UCM, you don't need to include the outbound proxy. But in case you have the IP phone registered to a SIP provider or third party IP PBX and they are using the outbound proxy, they will provide you with that information. And most of the time it is, it is a different IP or different domain than the one used for the SIP server. Because when you configure the outbound proxy, the phone will add a new header to the SIP message. And some SIP servers, they might not like that. So just make sure you add outbound proxy only if it is required by the SIP provider. Another option that I would like to mention here is under audio settings. So as you can see, the IP phone is configured by default to uh, negotiate for multiple codecs. But the problem with that is that the more information you include in the SIP message, the larger the IP packets becomes. And that causes problems with routers that don't support IP fragmentation. Because usually you don't have an idea about the router that is used by the remote user, and you don't know whether it, the router supports IP fragmentation or not. So just to avoid that, you can change those to the main codec that is used by the uh, by the SIP server. For example, the UCM, I know it supports PCMU or G711U. Uh, you can set all of them to PCMU so that the phone, when it sends that information, it's only gonna include one codec in the media message instead of eight. So doing that would reduce the size of the IP packet so you don't run into uh, issues. And one of the symptoms uh, related to IP fragmentation on IP phones is that when you dial a number, you will see that the phone is trying to connect. It's gonna keep trying to connect for like 10 seconds, then it's gonna play busy tone. So that's one of the symptoms. If you ever experienced that one, that could be an indication that there is a problem with IP fragmentation on the router. All right, so now that we talked about the settings that you need to enable on the IP phone, so let's go ahead and look at the SIP settings or the configuration that we need to make on the UCM. So as I mentioned, the UCM, you need to configure port forwarding on the edge router to allow remote extensions to register to the UCM. So let me go to PBX settings, SIP settings, and NAT settings. So to avoid issues related to audio, and cause disconnecting after 32 seconds, 
if your edge router has a static IP address or domain name, you can include that information here. For example, if your router is using this public IP address, just make sure you add that one here. And under the local network address, you specify the local subnets. So for example, my subnet here is 192.168.0.024, which is already here added. Then you just specify the subnet. So let me move this and add it to the list of local subnets. And the purpose of doing that is that the UCM, every time it sees traffic coming from these subnets, it will change the information here and use the public IP address when communicating with devices located on the public network. Another thing that we always recommend for security purposes in general, either you are using remote phones or not, is to change the UDP port for SIP from 5060 to a different port number. For example, you can change it to 5080, 5090, any ports that is not being used by any device in your network. So when you change it right here and the external UDP port, just make sure you do the same thing right here too, 5080. But when you change the port on the, uh, on the UCM, you need to make sure that you add that port to the remote phones. Let me go back here. So for example, if I change that port from 5060 to a different port, let's say 5080, the phones by default, when you don't enter the port number, they use port 5060. So if you are using a different port, you need to specify that as well here. And you're gonna do the same thing for all the phones. If you have phones that are configured through the UCM zero config, you can simply go to zero config and push the update and the UCM will communicate it's a new uh, SIP port. However, if you have remote users, you need to add the port or the UDP port for SIP manually. So earlier also I talked about the RTP Keep Alive, which I said is useful, especially when you have remote uh, users. And this option is also useful when you have call forwarding. So let's say someone calls the UCM, then you enable call forwarding to an external number. This feature can be very, very helpful. And this option is right here. I think by default is set to zero. So you just need to make sure to set that one to one. And as I mentioned earlier, once you change the value from zero to one, this will allow the UCM to read the connection IP address for the media in the SIP message and send uh, an RTP packet to both uh, the caller and the callee so that it can punch holes in the router to allow the audio traffic to reach the UCM. All right, so let's go here under extensions and let's talk about the settings that you need to enable at the extension level. And one of the options is the enable keep alive. Enable Keep Alive is useful because it allows the UCM to check the status of the remote phone, to check if that phone is still reachable or not. So when the UCM sends multiple SIP options and there is no response from the uh, remote IP phone, the status will change from idle to unavailable. That's why sometimes when you have phones that lose registration, but when you come to the UCM, you still see it's idle because if you don't enable this option, the UCM has no way of knowing that the remote phone uh, is not connected anymore. So that's one of the options that you can enable. So it makes monitoring remote extensions easier. The other security option is available under media ACL policy. That's something that I usually uh, recommend implementing on the production UCM. So if you have this extension only used on a local subnet, you can specify the local subnet. So if a remote user happens to have access to the SIP authentication password, they will be able to register to the UCM and they will be able to make calls, of course. But when you specify the local subnet, the UCM will only accept SIP registration from this subnet, even if the authentication is correct. So that's one of the things that you can uh, uh, implement. So if you have like one extension used both in the office and remote user, if the remote user 
it has a static public IP address, so you can include that as well here. However, if you have a remote user that don't have a static public IP address and their IP keeps changing all the time, then it's not recommended to enable this option. Because once you enable it, the UCM will reject the SIP registration request from that remote IP phone. That brings us to the end of this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful. If there is a topic that you would like us to cover in the next episode, please include that in the comments. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.